Welcome back. Having discussed the movement of the centers of learning from Greece to Alexandria to Jundashapur and finally Baghdad and Andalusia, we now turn to the motivation for the Muslims' translations and subsequent rise of Mashai philosophy. Why did the Muslims spend so much time on translations from Greek and other languages? Western scholars say that the caliphs wanted good medicine, and so they translated medical works into Arabic. But Cyrus the Great, the Persian emperor who captured all of Greece and Western Asia, simply hired Greek physicians. He could have had Greek medicine translated into Avesta, but he did Another reason given by Western scholars is that because Muslims needed to find the direction of prayer, they were interested in astronomy. It's true, to perform your rites anywhere you need some knowledge of astronomy and geography. But in early Islam, nobody missed his or her prayers because he or she didn't know Greek astronomy. So we must look into the inner workings of Islamic civilization. There are two elements in the Islamic revelation that forced Muslims to come to terms with the vast body of learning of the civilizations which preceded them, namely the Greek Alexandrian and also the Persian and the Indian. The first element is that the Islamic revelation is based upon knowledge. Knowledge in Islam saves. A hadith of the Prophet says, Say there is no God but Allah and be saved. Now, la ilaha illallah is a statement of knowledge, a statement upon the nature of reality. It's an affirmation of the oneness of God. It is not a statement of emotion, of service, of love, or other important elements religions must have. It puts knowledge before everything else. What is primary in Islam, what saves, is knowledge. Knowledge in Islam has a soteriological aspect. Soteriology means the study of that which saves. What brings salvation? In Christianity, it's love for Christ and belief in his death as salvation for sinners. And there are other elements as well. In Islam, it's knowledge. In Christianity, knowledge does not fulfill a soteriological function as it does in Islam. Simply put, Christianity is essentially a path of love. Islam is essentially a path of knowledge. Although Christianity cannot be exclusive of knowledge, nor Islam exclusive of love. It's a question of emphasis. Theoretically speaking, Christianity could have ignored the Greek philosopher's view about the nature of the world, because faith in Christ and love of God leads to salvation. Many Christian theologians have held this position throughout history. Now, Islam could not do that because of its own inner structure. A way based upon knowledge cannot be impervious to other ways of knowing. Any knowledge claim had to be examined as being either true or false. And the Greek philosophical heritage claimed to present knowledge dealing with the structure of reality, with God, the world, human beings, and their interrelationships. So this heritage posed an immediate question to Islam as a religion based upon knowledge. This is the first important element in the motivation of the Muslims to translate Greek and other philosophical texts. The second element had to do with the fact that Islam claims for itself finality of revelation. The Quran says explicitly that the prophet of Islam is the last prophet. The Bible does not say this of any prophets of the Old Testament, nor does the New Testament say this about Christ. Christ is unique in Christianity, but uniqueness does not imply finality. Now, finality implies integration. A final exam integrates all your knowledge of the Course. And by virtue of finality, Islam claimed to integrate the whole prophetic cycle and bring it back to its origin. Since the beginning and end always meet in the deepest sense of the term, a religion that claims for itself finality also claims to be at the origin of things, and therefore primordial. Reality is like a circle in the metaphysical sense. God refers to himself in the Quran as the beginning and the end. As you recall from our earlier discussions, 
By virtue of seeing itself as the first religion and the last religion, Islam accepts everything that came in between. Islam claims that the first religion began with Adam. The first human being was the first prophet. The first religion asserted the unity of God, because according to Islam, at the heart of all religion is the assertion of divine unity. And because of humanity's forgetfulness, God sent other prophets to reassert it. That's how Islam sees sacred history. One of the consequences of this view for philosophy is that Islam saw the sacred history of other religions as its own. It accepted what had been revealed in those religions as its own to the extent that it did not deviate from divine unity. When Islam encountered different religions, the Muslims thought elements in them which conformed to divine unity were the remnants of the message of the older prophets, and therefore they were Islamic in the deepest sense. While many of the jurisprudence and theologians labeled some followers of other religions as unbelievers, from the point of view of Islamic intellectual life, everything that conformed to divine unity was seen as having come ultimately from prophecy and religion. Christianity had more trouble encountering these ancient religions and philosophies. It was much easier for Islam to do so because of its way of looking at Greek and other philosophies. And that is the deepest reason why Arabic became the repository of the whole wisdom of the antiquity. So if you lived in Baghdad in the third Islamic century or the ninth Christian century, if you were a thinking person, you began to see around you texts of Aristotle, of Plato, of Plotinus, of the great Greek philosophers and philosophical issues came upon the scene. And it is from the encounter between the living Islamic intellectual world and this intellectual world that Islamic philosophy was born. This concludes our discussion of the necessary background for the rise of the Mashai school, and next time we'll turn to its greatest figures.